What's up, guys? Sumner from LandInvestor.co. Today, I'm joined by my good friend, Peter, from Once Upon a Brick. Peter has an incredible story. He sold over 1,500 properties, none of which have been sourced through direct mail. We're going to talk about how he's selling hundreds of properties a year without spending any money on marketing. Kind of a crazy story because Peter and I go way back um, when we were kind of on our, our land investing come up story. This is probably two, two and a half years ago. Actually, I remember walking on the beach in La Jolla or talking on the phone. We have radically different approaches to the land business. So it's going to be really interesting to kind of unpack how he's doing things. And I think Peter's proof to the fact that there's so many different ways to make money in this business, right? A lot of different angles you can take. There's not just one way to skin the cat. So Peter, thanks for joining us, man. Where are you calling in from? Chicago. Chicago. Love it. Love it. I, uh, I've only been to Chicago once and I liked it. I went to the South side by accident and then I really didn't like it. And I was like, dude, <laughs> this is, this is a war zone out here, man. It's crazy. What part of Chicago are you in? Are you like in the city? No. So I was last year and now I'm out in the suburbs. Okay. Nice. North, Northwest suburbs. So it's very, uh, it's very suburban out yeah. here, but I love it. Do you have a family? Are you working on having a family? Uh, no, no. I'm just with my parents. Okay. Okay. Love it. So is, is the plan to stay there? I know you're a vagabonder, always traveling the world, or do you plan to, to pack your bags and move somewhere else? Uh, maybe in the future, but right now I love it. You know, I'm just yeah. here. I don't have, you know, I don't have to manage things and like, you know, all the things that go along with having your own place. Yeah. Um, and then if I just want to travel, I just pick up pack and then I go. It's nice. Um, so yeah, man, for now, for the foreseeable, you know, next year or so, I think yeah. I'm, I'm happy. I mean, I want to move to Florida yep. uh, for the winter because but I'm done with, I'm done with, you know, I'm done with the winners out here. Yeah. No, I second that man. Cold weather sucks. I wish, I wish my parents let me live with them. Unfortunately, they, I turned 18. They said, get out of here. You're, you're done. Um, but I, yeah, no, that, that's dope, man. I think I, I tell folks when you're starting your business, anything you can do to minimize expenses, like dude, I would sleep on someone's couch if I had to. And really in the beginning of my land business, that was the playbook. Like every dollar went back into the business I think I attribute a lot of my progress to just that. So let's talk about your origin story. How the heck did you get in the land business? What was it like initially? And then how did you end up where you are today? Because you've taken a really different path than most land investors. Yeah, it's a super long story, but I, I'll you know preface it by saying um, ever since I've, I was young, like I think 15 is when I started my first quote unquote business. Yep. And um, you know it, it was a lot of different things like fixing computers, uh, Legos. I started a clothing brand, which I recently sold. Um, you know, um, just trying all these different businesses, you know, since I was 15. And it, during like my third, uh, actually last year of college, um, you know, I've always read that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, and, you know, they talk about owning assets and getting passive income. Um, so, started researching like how can I get into real estate and then landed on like oh let's get some uh, rental property right uh, but the problem was being in college having uh, no access to like credit or you know w2s and all that stuff no one's gonna give give me a loan or no one did so um, so I started researching like alternative assets right so you know, read about mobile homes and all this stuff and ended up on land, right? Because I was like top 10 ways to invest in real estate without, you know, rental properties, right? Um, and then I started listening to a bunch of podcasts, right? And I think the first podcast that really exposed me to, you know, this whole industry, uh, it was called like the Side Hustle Show with Nick Loper. Part of the song, yep. Yeah. And that was the podcast that I listened to this, this land investor. He's like, yeah, we buy land in, you know, in the States and it's like a couple thousand dollars. Um, and then we sell it on owner financing for like six or seven years and people pay us every month. Um, so I was fascinated, started looking up cheap land for sale, then ended up on this website called land watch. Um, and then started looking through, you know, like listings right in Ar rural Arizona sorted it from like low to high and saw that there was a piece of land for $2,000 in Hallbrook, Arizona. I was a skeptic, right? I was like, oh, this is probably BS. This is, you know, not true. How can you buy a piece of land for 2000 
because when I go on Redfin or Zillow and put near me, it shows me land that's 500,000, 700,000, 800,000, you know. And oh yeah, banks don't give you loans on land, by the way. So even if you bought this thing, um, you have to buy it for cash. And, you know, so I started doing that. What really kicked this whole thing off was when I called Matt Nunn from Nunn Land Sales about that $2,000 piece of land in Hallbrook, Arizona. And he was like, yeah, there's this whole industry. We buy land from people who don't want them. And then we just resell it on the internet. Um, and people pay us every month because we do owner financing. So never took a course until like a year into the business. And he was my mentor pretty yeah. much. So I called him and he, and I was like, Hey, cause I learned from other businesses, like my t-shirt business, right? If I want to start my own t-shirt brand, do I really need to fly all the way to a factory somewhere in Asia and open up my own factory to print, you know, make t-shirts and do all of that? No, I could just go to the wholesaler that's 30 miles from me. And he does all of that. I just pay him a premium to buy it from him. So that that's the business model that I've always been used to. So I called Matt none. And I was like, Hey, if I buy three pieces of land from you, do you think you can cut me a break so that I can resell this and get this monthly passive income? Um, that just seems so wonderful. And it, it is. Um, so then he's like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And then I started asking him, I'm like, okay, so how are you going to transfer it to me? Or how do I know I own it? He's like, yeah, you have what's called a deed. So I was completely clueless. I did, I not, I did not know what a land contract was. Didn't know, you know, I didn't know nothing, right. I was just this guy that wanted to be in real estate. So he basically walked me through the process. So I bought my first few pieces of land from him. Um, so I've been talking for a while, so I'm going to keep going, brother. You're good. <laughs> so that's how it started. Bought the first few pieces of land. Okay. Okay. Dude. So a lot of parallels between our stories, right? Like I always tell people, I was, I was given no option. I was born an entrepreneur, right? And I look at the way we've built our land business. It's really just been stacking skill sets from other businesses. Like, and I, I when I came in, I took no course. I didn't take a, my first course was last year. Like, I took no course for three years. And I was just like, yeah, I think I can piece this together. The irony was though, like I knew enough about building a business to like get up and running and start selling deals. But I knew nothing about real estate. I was just talking from uh, to Seth from RE Tipster like an hour before we got on. And I was like, dude, if it wasn't for a purchase agreement that he sold on his website, I probably would have never gotten started because I was so clueless on what a purchase agreement was, what a deed was, what a land contract was. Um, now, luckily, those weren't barriers to stopping me, but I, I, I resonate with that, right? And so you just said, hey, because if you went through a course, truth be told, the model that you're following probably would have never been presented to you. Like you just stacked from previous experiences and you're like, Hey, I, I used to do this with you know, buying t-shirts from a printer locally and you do pay a premium. I'm curious though, why'd you go that route? Cause I'm sure you were in Facebook groups and watching YouTube and like, you probably had enough of a foundational understanding to say, Hey, other people are marketing to owners. I'm sure Matt told you this too. What made you want to go directly to the land investor opposed to doing your own marketing? Yeah. And Sumner, so before I like answer that, what I wanted to say is I think I've been following your marketing for a while yeah. and you know, your, your website and like whatever land watch listings, I think that's honestly was the key. Yeah. Right. Like even for you with what you've built and what you've done, right. Your marketing is so differentiated and I'm sure the way you do your business is so much different yeah. than like following some template. Yeah. Or, 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 you know, or whatever. So I think there's power in that too. For sure. Right. right. Just yeah. going your own way and, you know, figuring things out because the thing is it helps you be unique, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If someone else is charging a doc fee and you don't charge a doc fee, you're unique. Right. Yeah. And the thing is, that's the beauty of it is like you blended all the things from other industries and you brought it into your own business. Yeah. And that just gives you, gave you a huge competitive like advantage Yep. Um, as far as why I didn't want to do mailers and all that, it seemed complicated. Um, <laughs> and it seems like a lot of work, like yep. talking to owners and like negotiating with them, running comps or, you know, I didn't even know what comps were. <laughs> um, so for me, I was like, you know what, this just seems like a shortcut and yep. it seems like 
you just go straight, text this guy a few times and like, he's like, how many do you want? I'm like, okay, I'll start with five. And, and, you know, he sends you a payment, payment link, you pay for it. And then you get, you get a deed a week later. So that whole process of sending, and there's honestly, now looking back, maybe that would have, you know, that could have also worked. And I'm sure that does work. Right. But for me, I just didn't know too much and I didn't want to spend the time building out that because that's a lot of work, yeah. right? What do you do with the lead when it comes in? Right. How do you, like, it's just so much. So I just did that because I was kind of lazy. Yeah. Um, and it was just the path of least resistance. Yeah. Do I think that like constraints though, uh, like uh, having that constraint of, I don't know what to do with the lead or it seems like too much work beautiful things come from that though right like sometimes creating constraints or guidelines and like not just going and doing the playbook that everyone else is doing but cool stuff can come from that right let's talk about the first what was it three or five deals you bought from matt walk us through what were the numbers on those deals like was it even profitable to buy from another land investor and flip them what did that look like oh yeah yeah yeah. well yeah So I think I got my first four pieces of land or three or something like that for, I think it was like under two grand. Um, So then what I did was, and it was a small deal. It wasn't like a life-changing deal, but it was a life-changing deal because I learned how to do it. Um, So basically bought it from him and then I sold it on payments, I think for like 39 or $49 a month for like 48 months. Yeah. So I think I got my money out of them in like seven months and the remaining 40 months on that contract were profit. Wow. Dude, Um, that's crazy. So even buying it wholesale from another land investor, like we always talk about a decent benchmark for, for terms is like, let's get our basis back in 12 months. Anything under that phenomenal, anything over that, eh, don't love it as much, but even buying it from another land investor, it's crazy that there was enough margin for him and for you to kind of daisy chain that deal. On a, on a quick tangent, I'm just curious because I've you know, followed your marketing for a long time. You guys are rock bottom on the owner finance pricing, right? Like it's crazy to think someone could actually own a piece of land for 40 bucks a month. And then, like some people are probably skeptical. I know it's the real deal. Like you guys are passing over those deeds. This isn't smoke and mirrors. What's the default rate that you guys see on that though? I mean, it must be ginormous, I would think, but I could be wrong. It, it is. And it was. <laughs> um so the thing is, that's why we've transitioned and we're still playing on the lower end of the market, yep. right? Like the $40 thing was like the first month that I started. And after that, I was like, hey, you know what? We need to bump this thing up. Yep. So then we went to 75, 99. Um, now we're not even doing that anymore. Like mm-hmm. like recently, within the last like month, we've decided that you know we're kind of um, more interested in attacking two, three, $400 minimum notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it's cool when you're starting out, um, you know, and you know, your first hundred deals or hundred um, notes, that's great. Cause it, it really changes your life and your business. Um, but after that, you know, when you're at 300 notes, it just becomes a lot of work, mm-hmm. right? And if you can just sell a hundred notes at 300 a month, that's 30 grand. Right. But if you're selling, you know, to get to 30 grand a month in income, uh, to you know, and you're selling $50 notes, you're going to be at like 600 or that's just a ton of parcels. Yeah. And then you have to manage all those people. Yeah. Right. So that's recently why we're moving into bigger stuff like 199, 299, 399 and stuff like that. Yeah. Dude, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. We literally just hired another person onto our team this month, actually April, to just have more support in managing our note portfolio, right? Like we do big deals, but for a, at a certain point in time, like I was doing similar stuff to you. Like we've got hundreds of notes that are at 100 bucks, 200 bucks a month. And we've got lots of bigger notes over the last few years as well. But the, 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 the trouble is like most people have been sold this pitch, passive income. We all know that's BS, right? But what, what, what people fail to realize is you have an arrangement with a customer that could last five, six, seven years. There's handholding and support that's needed during that duration, right? And so it's actually crazy what happens when you've got hundreds of people paying you every month. Not only is there a lot of managing just to ensure they actually pay you on time, there's still a lot of customer service that goes on for years, right? And so I want to just fast forward a little bit and we're kind of kind of unpack and backtrack a little bit, but to wet the palate of everyone listening, 
Where are you at in the land business today? Let's talk about volume. I know you guys are doing bigger notes now. We'll unpack that here in a second. Talk about how your team structured, what you guys are looking to do in 2023. Give me a little breakdown there. Yeah, so our business has changed a lot. And within the last year, we actually started wholesaling. So we almost had a full flip, right? So before 80% of our business was retail, right? And we were, we were our wholesale was non-existent, meaning that we sell to land investors, yeah. right? Um, within the last year, it's flipped. So 80% of our business now is wholesale and 20% is retail. Um, you know, or I just see activity, right? It doesn't have to be the numbers and stuff, but like just our focus and our activity, 80% now is wholesale. We're selling to land investors and 20% is retail. And now we're also trying to build back up the retail. And we're doing that by specifically choosing which properties because before we were just putting everything on our website and being like yeah everything owner financed mm. but now we're specific we're like okay we're gonna put only the big stuff on our website and you know wholesale the rest or you know whatever um as far as the team today um it's me and then there is uh mike who's our director of sales and he's out of nevada um and then we have um um, Noah who's our director of operations. So he does like deeds and like all that kind of stuff and making sure he works with our customer service person. Um, our customer service person is Erin Nola. So she's out of Houston. Um, and, uh, and then I hired my executive assistant joy, uh, last week. So she's also from Houston. Yeah. Um, and so that's pretty much it for the, for the U S based yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, and that's four people. Um, and then overseas, of course, like we have the Philippines team, mm -hmm. which handles like the website back office, due diligence, that kind of stuff. Um, and then in Pakistan, we have a team that's recently experimenting with texting. Mm. So like for deals and stuff on yep. the bigger stuff that we're experimenting with. Interesting. Yeah. We've got a similar breakdown. We've got a handful of folks in the U S Pakistan and Philippines, ironically enough, uh, which is, I didn't even know that. Um, dude, talk to me about just the, the owner finance portfolio as it is today. You don't have to give me hard numbers and what it brings in, but I mean, I would imagine you guys still have hundreds of small dollar properties in there. How big is that portfolio? Roughly. Uh, looks like hey Pete, looks like your audio went out. Can you hear me now? Yes, gotcha. Okay. Um, so today we're at about 200 notes on the retail side. Okay. Um, for owner financing. 200 um, notes on the retail side. Do you guys have a note portfolio for investors as well? Uh no. So no uh for, for our Sorry, say that again, Sumner? So, yeah. So, like, you guys are kind of transitioning to, to working with investors, right? What I've seen is there's two different routes there. You can just do flat wholesale, pay us cash, or there's, like, and I've seen you do it in the past. There's arbitraging the finance notes. So, you pay me 50, you go sell it for 100 a month. Do you guys have a portfolio of investors' notes? Not anymore. Not anymore. Um, okay. Wholesale, we're only doing cash because okay. it's just simpler. They take ownership. And it, we're all able to offer a better deal when it's cash because yep. – you know, we get instantly liquidated and they're also getting a big discount for using cash. Gotcha. So we, we're not currently uh, doing land. That's called land arb or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we used to do that. And that was cool when we first started. But now it's cash only um, because it's just, you know, the management part of it. Someone wants to transfer you know, the customer wants their customer wants to pay it off. And then it's just a mess. So we just transfer the deed to them and they pay us cash and <laughs> easy peasy. So talk yeah. to me about what, what was the thought process behind pivoting from retail to, to more of an investor focus? Was that just a decline in retail leads or is that just like, Hey, the quality of these retail leads because the deals are so cheap are, are not good, right? That's something that we've seen in our business. So talk to me about the thought process behind that. Yeah. Now it's uh, the reason was it, you know, like we just wanted to experiment with it. We had so much inventory and we're like, hey, you know, like, why don't we experiment with just liquidating, right? Getting cash heavy, right? You know, the economy and all this stuff. We started doing it here and there and it just started picking up, right? And I was like, you know, am I really going to try and fight what's working? 
right? Because the thing is, the reason why it worked really well was because some people, when they, they it's there's like a term called wholetail, which mm -hmm. is which is actually just like when people say this is this property or this deal is wholesale, but it's actually retail. And what we did is we just had great pricing. Um, and it was honestly pretty underpriced. So people started buying it and they're like, hey, give me 20, give me 30. And it was just really nice, right? Yeah. For yeah. at once you're you're getting rid of 30 properties or 20 or tens. And we started building those relationships. Um, you know, so now now it's we're trying to balance that. Right. Because yeah. the wholesale is cool. But the problem is, as soon as you sell, you need to have a pipeline to replenish it. Yeah. So I think having a balance just builds you a stronger, puts you in a stronger financial position. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, this it's a little bit of a dance. There's no like actual science to it or reason um, of why we shifted. But it was just nice to get into a more financially solid position with liquidity. Uh, because terms notes are cool, but you're going to be waiting again a year or two to get your money back, right? And then, of course, sometimes people default, and then you have to go sell it again. So I think the combination of both is amazing. Yeah. Talk to me about, uh, I know you guys are, are wholesaling smaller end deals, just broad strokes here. I mean, what's like the, the gross spread on that? Are we talking about making 100 bucks on a deal, 500 or grand? What's what's typical that you're seeing with, with these kind of wholesale deals? And this is probably not specific to you. I think it's like there's plenty of land investors that wholesale cheaper lots. I've always been curious, like, you know, the, the guy, Matt Noon, you bought it for sounds like 500 or so. He must have bought it for a couple hundred bucks. Like, what's the expectation there in terms of what you, you should see for a spread? Sure. It's challenging, right? Because not every deal can be wholesaled because there's not enough margin. Yeah. And we don't wholesale anything that the retail, that the, you know, the land investor can at least double on. Because, okay. I mean, and we're very cautious with that because the lifetime value of a relationship with the land investor is exponential. Yeah. And yeah. we don't want to risk the chance of selling someone something where they can't make money on. Yeah. So and because that's just, you know, we just don't do that. Um, and so how it works is, so I'll give you a specific example. Last year, we bought 350 lots in Izzard County, Arkansas. I remember and that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and now we're we're now we're you know we only own like eighty lots, so the, most of them are sold. Yeah. So how that deal worked is the retail cash on that is like thirty five hundred, right? So you, the the land investor can sell it for thirty five hundred. Um, they can own or finance it probably for like forty eight hundred, so like ninety nine a month for forty eight months or whatever like that. Yeah. Um, and then we sold it to them for nine fifty. Okay. And our margin on that usually is about 20 to 30 percent. So it might be it might have been a couple hundred. But, you know, we've had people who started being like, oh, give me five. Right. They buy five. Then they come back two weeks later. Give me ten. And again, you know, it's just repeating. Yeah. And then before, you know, some people bought like 50 from us. Just yeah. One, yeah. one land investor. Right. And that's where it's kind of fun. Yeah. Um, you know, when you build because that that's our focus is we build like repeating relationships, yeah. right? On the wholesale side. Like one and dones are never that's never gonna work, right? And there's a lot of land invest like land wholesale deals that are like that and not interested in doing that, right? So we like to make a small amount, 20%, 25, 30, but we focus on like some of the, like almost we've retained almost all of our wholesale clients it's crazy um, right? i think you guys got the right mindset around that right like in, in any business i've ever ran the land business for what we do on the higher ticket stuff is a little bit different like inside our coaching business and whatnot like ltv is everything right and it's like so many people are looking for the quick buck and they just erode the lifetime value of that of that customer in the long term so i think that's it's wise on your guys's part right and that's i mean from a wholesale perspective Buy for nine fifty or nine seventy five, whatever it was, and sell for 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 over three grand. Just a great deal for the land investor. You know, it's, that's a pretty incredible spread that they can get wholesale. So, just so I'm understanding this correctly, you guys got three hundred and sixty lots or so in Izzard County. You guys also got that from another land investor. Like you didn't market for those properties. What was the story there? Yeah, so it's a combination. Sometimes we buy tax deeds, okay. and sometimes we buy it from other investors. 
right? So these this lot, these in Izzard County were all um, tax sales. Yeah. So we actually, I actually had someone go out there, attend the auction, and bid on every single one. Mm. So wow. it's a combination of tax deeds and like uh, investors. Mm-hmm. Like so I'm going to play the devil's advocate for you. I'm, I'm curious. So what did you say? The Izzard County lots are worth like 3,800, right? Retail? They're 35 or it depends on Somewhere. how you market it. Yeah, yeah. Call it, let's call it 35 to be to be realistic. So <laughs> you've got a bunch of these. You're in them at you know 750 or whatever it is, 700 bucks. Why not just go and put them on the market at two grand or 2,200 and turn them really quick and you know add an extra thousand bucks to every deal that you're doing? I'm just curious what's the thought process there because I would reckon, I mean, yes, it would take a while to move that much supply, even undercutting retail. But if you've got cheap enough capital on the back end to fund those deals, timelines don't really matter as much. So what's the thought process there and how are you funding this stuff? Yeah, so I don't use any outside money and stuff like that. I've never have. Um, Honestly, it's just been reinvesting into the business over two years and all those notes, you know. Um, And yeah, we could. We could retain everything and sell it one by one. Um, But the nice thing is when you wholesale, you get your money out, right? And so what we did is we like keep half of them usually and then sell half of them. Gotcha. And so basically the profit that comes in from the sale of the wholesale, like the 20 or 30% Delta um, covers some of our retail holdings, mm. right? Because if I just did that for every property or every deal that we bought, our capital would be tied and we wouldn't be buying other deals. So yep. all the wholesale stuff, we would take that and then roll the capital into the next acquisition. Yeah. And it's basically snowballs. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I I see the logic behind it, right? Like the the uh, investor wholesale stuff covers some of the basis and the retail stuff. I like look, looking at it from that perspective. What I've always thought though is, and it's different, like when you're doing bigger deals, right? To bring joint venture capital into a singular deal is pretty easy. But even for the guys doing smaller deals, especially the guys that are wholesaling, I've always wondered, it's like, why not just go raise a couple hundred grand on a promissory note for three years at eight, 10% interest and just redeploy that in your business. And instead of wholesaling it, go get that retail price. Because if it's cheap enough capital and you've got a long enough time horizon, it's like it's in your best interest to do so. Same thing with the owner finance stuff, right? Like I, I often think about, man, I should just go raise a couple million bucks and just build a monster owner finance portfolio. It wouldn't, it really wouldn't be that difficult. Um, so it's interesting. Have you ever thought about bringing in outside capital? Because you've got such a solid proof of concept and I was using the same playbook for a long time where I was just using all of my own money. And we, we had to make decisions based off of liquidity, which really cut into what we could be making. Right. So similar stuff with the wholesaling. So what's the thought process behind raising capital? Yeah, I think that's brilliant, man. Um, I think I just haven't done it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. There's a problem when things are working, right? It's like, sometimes it's easy to just do what works. But I would say there's so much meat on the bone to just yeah. get cheaper cost of capital and get your top capital out of these deals, you know? Maybe, yeah. And I think like I want to look into that because yeah. as, as we're transitioning into like, you know, a little bit larger properties like 10 grand, 20, 30 mm-hmm. retail, um, you know, I want to look into that because yeah. then, yeah, you're right. You could just go buy a bunch and yeah, that would be, that would be really smart and i yep. think i'm gonna make sure to look <laughs> we'll have to report back on it do a second podcast i mean capital is the bedrock of what we do right and if you are you have a team you're not really running marketing but you have a team you're running marketing and you're acquiring properties unless you're daddy warbucks it's almost impossible to grow not saying you can't run the business but there's just rarely enough left over because the capital cycles are long in this business to actually like really scale and so yep. when we said, hey, our capital just goes to our team and it goes to marketing and everything else gets funded, it's, everything changed. And I think it's harder with smaller deals because we can bring in one-off partners to, and we give them equity in a singular deal. And we have other funding strategies, but that's a really easy one. You can't really do that on small deals. It's just, too, it's just not worth anyone's time. But you can raise debt and it's not that difficult to do. So something that we should talk about further. I think you guys would do really well. And you've got such a proof of concept, right? Like you've got, and even if it's still just a wholesale model, you could just do more of it, 
right? Yeah. Uh, if we look at every business in almost any industry, yeah, there's a few outliers that bootstrap, but most businesses need capital. And that's why there's a whole world of VC firms and private equity and all that stuff. Um, talk to me about the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, man. Uh, one quick thing I just remembered. Yeah. So we actually uh, took like a loan from QuickBooks. Okay. They offered us a capital loan. Yeah. So I did that actually. So I've been getting was, emails from them. How was that? How was that experience? Um, honestly, man, it's pretty good. The only thing that sucks is you have to, like, so for example, right, they'll give you 150 grand, mm. but then you have to pay back like nine grand a month. Mm. So, so I mean, as long as you're okay with that, right? So they take back principal and interest, and yep. it's over like a 24 month thing or 18 months. Yep. And yep. like, I just did it just because I was curious. I was like, yeah, let's see what. <laughs> <laughs> but and you can write off the interest as an expense, right? Which is super cool, super cool. Yeah, yeah. we've been. Uh, I get emails from them, uh, emails from Stripe as well. They've got something similar. Um, I've never never taken them up on it. But one of the things that uh, a lot of the folks in our program are doing, and something that I'm doing, have you ever heard of Funding Grow? I have seen their emails and I've yeah. seen their website, but I don't know much about them. Super cool, super cool idea. Something that I've thought for a long time. I'm like, there has to be a way to do this. So if you look at most business credit cards, there are usually always zero interest for the first 12 months or a year and a half. And so I'm like, if there's a way to get the money off the credit card and into escrow, you've got 0% capital for a year. That seems crazy. Well, sure enough, there is a way to do it. And so what Funding Row does is usually it's five grand. We got like a discounted rate for the group that's 3,500. You can actually have two people go on the same account and split that. You'll have separate accounts. It won't be like your credit won't be tied, but you can split that cost with someone. Totally worth it. So you can get up to about a quarter million or so, um, at all at 0%. Then we use a company called Plastic that charges a 2.9% processing fee, and they wire that money into escrow. So even if you only get a quarter million or 100 grand, you can snowball that 10 times, 12 times, 15 times in a year and pay zero interest on the 2.9% processing fee. Uh, and for you, you wouldn't even need to use plastic because you don't even use escrow. So you just check out on the Stripe pages for the other wholesalers and just check out that way. So what they do for that fee is they go to literally every single bank out there, open a million and one different 0% credit cards, go in and argue and get the best rate for you. So you get the highest loan amount. And yeah, you just and just obviously ensure that you pay it off in the you know, before the year or whatever it may be. But we've got tons of folks that don't they don't use it exclusively to fund their deals but they'll fund one or two deals a month just from that. Um, what's dope too, everything that you fund, you get credit card points on. So we could go spend $2 million with them this year and we'll get like, you know, 2 million to 4 million credit card points, which is crazy. And so like what I look at for the capital stuff is we're always just stacking different capital streams to kind of piece everything together. That would be great for what you're doing though. And you wouldn't even need to use plastic because you probably never use title companies, right? Sometimes, but rarely. Very rare. Yeah, I, I would assume so. Um, dude, so you brought up a point earlier and just a minute ago too about going up market, going after some bigger deals, bigger notes. What's the thought process behind that? Have you realized that, holy crap, the input for big deal, small deal is the same, yet the output is wildly different? Now, what's the push for going up market? Yeah, so when I started... I mean, till now, we've always just gone after small, smaller deals, right? Smaller deals, meaning sub 20, sub 10, right? Um, and now it's less work, right? Um, and now the cost of capital, like we're able to put up more, right? When we start, like, I think the small stuff is a phenomenal way to get started and not, you know, like put bet the whatever you call it, bet the farm or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that's, that's, that was great when it started and it got us here. And I think now for the next step to reduce, cause like, I just don't want to keep hiring a million people, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I just want to enjoy my life yeah. and, you know, maintain sovereignty over our business mm -hmm. and my personal life. Right. I don't have the desire to build the largest land company yeah. I just want a, a business that is bulletproof that, you know, fuels my lifestyle. And I'm very happy with just where we're at. Right. Um, so the reason why I want to go after bigger stuff is it reduces the number of customers to manage uh, number of trans number of transactions, number of deeds to send out number of like just things to do. Right. It just reduces that. 
And also while reducing that, it also increases our income, yeah. um, our monthly recurring uh, revenue or income or whatever you call it. Yeah. Um, so now we've done that the last two years. We built up our, you know, our seed capital or whatever, and now I just want to deploy that into like larger maintenance-free assets. Yep, yep, yeah. I always tell people inside our community and, and, and elsewhere, it's like every deal in your business adds friction, right? It doesn't matter if it's a big deal or small deal. Every deal, let's say, it has forty different checklist items that have to get done. So when we were running a business that was doing two hundred and fifty deals a year, and we were closing on everything from owners, so it's like. A to Z, there are so many pieces to get done. And now this year we'll probably do 50 deals. And last year we did like 110 and we're continually stair-stepping down and yet our revenue grows every year, right? Just for, for example, we're working on a deal right now uh, in Texas is 350 acres. Um, this has been like a long process back and forth. Anyways, it's uh, 350 acres. We're buying it for like 3,500 an acre, chopping it up into 10 acre lots. It might have to be a little bit larger. Uh, maybe 15 to 20 acres. It just depends on how we're going to be cutting in this road. And that one deal will net us about 2 million bucks all said and done. Now, does it take a little more effort than a standard deal? Yes, but it's not a linear like representation, right? So if, if a deal that nets me 10 grand takes five hours, this deal that can net 2 million probably takes 20 hours, 30 hours. You know what I mean? It's just like the inputs, the outputs are so mismatched. And when I looked at the smaller deal stuff, I'm like, what I'm getting on the back end for the input is just so little. And to go after bigger deals really doesn't require that much more. Um, there's just the mindset and the expectations change. Like I might have to go spend 20 grand on marketing to get one deal that kind of fits our uh, avatar of a, a land deal that we want to do. But if it nets us a couple hundred grand, why not? The math still pencils, right? Um, so I think it's wise that you guys are going up market. I bet if we had this call a year later, you're probably going to say, yeah, we're keep on going up market, right? Yeah. Now there's a threshold where things start to change, right? I think over a quarter million buyers start to dry up. The market's different. Owners are much more savvy. They usually don't need liquidity. So like they don't need a fire sale of property. So that's where like the value add strategies come into play. Um, for this year, I know we're almost halfway into it, which is bizarre. What are the goals yeah. for this year? And are you on track to hit them? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, the other side is going to be to really, you know, like we were talking about this before is community. Right. Um, so after we started like last year offering wholesale, we built out about like 20 to 30 strong relationships, strong like relationships with other land investors. Um, the, the goal for this year is to continue growing that. Yeah. Right. Is to have a network, right? To build our own network of land investors, um, and meaning like there's no like like actual network or whatever. It's just we know them, yep. we've transacted with them. Um, so that's the main goal is to build that side, both like buying more from them and selling to other land investors. Yep. Um, and also, like I said, we're, we've I've taken like you know we're completely shifting the retail side, right? We've taken off all the small stuff you know, and we're trying to go uh, get larger notes. Yeah. So the goal for this year is to build a long-term hold portfolio for retail. So like we just, you know, maybe, you know, if you own like 300 or 400 one acre lots somewhere, um, you know, and you can just sell all of them. Yeah. So that's pretty much what we're trying to do this year is exactly. build out our holding or the retail holding. And also while doing that, build um our relationships yep so that they kind of they're synergistic one feeds the other let's talk about like dollars and cents is there like a note value number you're like dude i want to add two million bucks to my note portfolio this year for the kind of long-term holds is there a north star that you guys are working towards or no yeah so i want to get to about 100 to 150 a month yep yeah and what do you think the note what do you think the total note value would be on that well, most of our terms are like 48 months. So yeah. it should, that should be around like 4 million bucks yep. or three. I think it's, yeah, certainly, certainly doable. And how long have you been in the land business? Three years, four years? Coming up on three, man. Three years. Crazy what can happen, dude. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's so mind boggling. So to, to get to that, you know, 150K a month or so, let's call it that on the top, the top end. What do we need? Like, let's reverse engineer that. What, what, what do you need to do? 
to make that happen. And it's probably not you doing all the action items, but like, who do you need on your team? Where are you going to source the deals? What's the playbook to get there? Yep. So assuming that we sell each note for, let's say 300 a month, right? So you need to do about 500 deals. Uh, yep. deals. But you already have an existing note portfolio. So you want to add 150K a month of new recurring revenue. Uh, no, I just no. want to get to 150. Okay. Okay. Right. So it's probably a little bit less. Yeah. A little bit less. So yeah, you're, yeah, you're probably right actually. So that might be like 400, 400, yeah. 400 or 300 something. Um, okay. So yeah, you guys, you guys aren't far off to, to get there. Will you touch any direct to owner marketing this year? Or is it still going to be just going, going from other land investors? So on the side, actually, I'm experimenting with texting, right? Mm -hmm. And mainly I was, so I'm trying to like have a few houses in different parts of the country, you know, mainly so I, I can live there, yep. right? So I want to live in San Diego. I want to live in Florida. Yep. So I'm trying, so we're, I'm actually texting and like my dad wants to live in North Carolina. So we're trying to like buy some land out there in Florida. So I'm texting, talking directly to owners over text messages. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're trying that. And you know, I, like for example, there's a guy in North Carolina that wanted like, he had six acres he wanted to sell. And so we're planning on buying that and then splitting them into like three two acre parcels and then yeah, putting yeah. it back on the market with uh with a realtor so yeah. experimenting like that whole subdividing um yeah. minor subdivides yeah 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 we've been doing a lot of the same we've got uh our first subdivide that we're closing on this week 60 acres we're chopping it up into six 10 acre lots um it's a really just a really cool kind of additional tool in the tool belt it's a great way too to go deploy a lot of capital at once like if i want to deploy five million dollars into acquisitions this year I would rather that be on 10 deals than, you know, 300 deals. Like it's just, yeah. as we talked about before, it's just a lot more to manage. Um, dude, I've got a, just a personal question for you. So we were, we were both selling land on TikTok back in the day. I'm sure things have changed a little bit. What was that like for you? Was that like the main engine for, for lead flow and for deal flow for retail buyers? What was the results from that? You had a big it TikTok. Was, yeah, it was a big engine, yeah. right? Uh, it wasn't the main one. Yeah. Um, because we tried a bunch of other things, but TikTok was great. Um, we got a bunch of customers who are still paying today from TikTok. Wow. Um, and I mean, I was quite kind of early on TikTok, yeah. right? Like I was, um, it was during the pandemic. I was just experimenting. I, and I was on TikTok as a user. And then I was like, you know what? I, and then I saw one, like, uh, there, there was Luke from Rural Vacant yeah. Land. <laughs> Um, and I was like, Hey, you know what? There's not a lot of land people on this whole TikTok thing. Yep. So then I just started making these random videos and then some of them started going viral. Um, and we actually got sales from that. And I was like, okay, you know what? This is working. Yeah. So I doubled down and then from there started really building it, uh, back up, yep. um, building it up. Right. And recently, like, you know, since we started wholesaling, I haven't really done too much on there. Um, but now again, I, I got to get back on there. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's just work, right? You have to be on making videos and that it's great. Yeah. Right. Um, but it's, it's amazing. Like it's free, yep. right? You know, I mean, you are investing your time, yep. but it does produce results and we have sold land on TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What we found is like, it definitely works. It was super lumpy. So it'd be like one video would go off and we would sell like one video. We sold like 70 grand of property from back when we were doing like smaller deals and then it'd be crickets for three weeks and then it'd happen again. It was like kind of it was all over the map, but it definitely does work. I think it works best on the lower end stuff. I always yeah. look at uh, Landio. I think they do a really good job with YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. And I think they probably get a lot of sales through their stuff and they do high ticket stuff. But if you look at their traction and the quality of their videos, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, yeah. Now, if someone wants to start buying wholesale deals from you, how do they get in that network? Do you guys have a website to send them to? Is it an email list? What does that look like? Yeah. So, I mean, we do things very manually for the yeah. wholesale thing because it's like we can't even like we need to first understand, you know, where the land investor is coming from mm -hmm. and like, you know, what does their marketing look like? Because we actually help like uh, my, my sales guy, Mike, he, he's great. He has a relationship with all the land investors. Yeah. And before we even sell something to them, we make sure that they're set up to even dispose of it, right? Even 
if they, they if, even if they come to us and they're like, oh, I want to buy a hundred. I'm like, okay, but like, you know, you understand that it's going to take some time to sell them. Yeah. And, you know, do you have a website and like all those things? So it's like a one-on-one -on -one re relationship, right? Yeah. So the best way is like email, right? So if you want to email me, it's sales at once upon a brick.com. Um, and then basically I would loop you in with Mike and then Mike does, you know, kind of like, just like an introduction thing and understanding, right? Because we, like I said, we never sell anything if we don't think it's going to work because yeah, well, we just have to like, you know, it's just a good way to do it. I, think. I agree. I agree. And it's hardly, I mean, no one does it like that. Right. It's like, Oh, we send out an Excel sheet. You can just buy one directly from there. We don't know who you are, but focusing on like the long-term value of that relationship is, is super wise. And there's plenty of people that can afford to buy a wholesale deal that sh certainly should not. You know what I mean? Like they're just so green to the business. So I think that's super wise. Um, usually we run very long. I've actually got an 11 o'clock coming up to go yeah. shout out land.com and try to end my contract with them. Um, before we hop off, I know you plug sales at onceuponabrick.com. Anywhere else you want to send people before we wrap this one up? No, man, that's pretty much it. And I mean, just say hi, introduce yourself, right? Like that the relationships is really what's valuable, right? Yep. Um, about this whole thing. So, you know, so yeah, just say hi, email, and then hop on a call and Go. we can see where it goes. I've got a, I've got a request for you uh, and something I think that might be helpful. After this call, I'll give you the link. Go into our Discord in the general chat, introduce yourself, put your email in there, say that we just finished a podcast. Um, would love to get you active in there as well. There's so many land investors that are a good fit for, for wholesaling. There's like 400 some odd folks in there right now um, that are you know definitely up. What you're doing is up their alley for the wholesale side of things. Um, so I recommend getting in there. I'll show the link after this. And then this will be uploaded here in a couple of days. And dude, we'll have to do a, a part two to follow up towards the tail end of this year. Hopefully you're at 150K. Uh, by then and <laughs> that's a long-term goal come on come on you got to compress those timelines man 12 week year stuff um also i think we'll be meeting up here in vegas so you got to keep me in the loop with that yeah man sounds good thank you so much for having me on i know i've been like bugging you about it so no dude you're i, I love your tenacity man you make it happen so he texted me a couple days ago and, and here we are on a call so appreciate it peter um, everyone, if you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. I really don't care. And we'll see you guys in the next one. <laughs> All right, we just ended that. Um, cool, man. I'm going to put the, I'll, I'll email you the link right now. Um, I definitely recommend go inside discord today. And there's Bro, just yeah, a bunch thank of different, you for that. yeah, yeah, for sure. There's a bunch of different threads in there.